All right, three after the hour, let's go in and get started. Um, bum, 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 bum. All right, community time. Is there anything from the community in general people would like to bring up that are not that is not on the agenda? All right, not hearing any. We have no updates for SDK. We haven't had a meeting. Uh, for the demo for KubeCon Europe, the, uh, it's coming along fairly nicely. We are getting more, more than uh, one participant involved now that we have the, the basic flow settled down. The document here is up to date with the message flows if you guys want to participate. Um, I, this one, just to give you guys a heads up, is quite a bit more complicated than ones we did in the past. So it would be beneficial if you do want your company to participate to get involved as quickly as possible. Um, not only because there's more coding on your side that needs to be done, but there's a very good possibility that there are bugs in the system and we need to have, flag those as soon as possible because there's a lot of moving pieces in this one. So you want to get those things ironed out relatively quickly. Um, <clears throat> but all the information you need is either in the proposal doc here or in the uh, demo Slack channel. So, oh, and we do have meetings um, after this call at 1 p.m. Eastern to talk about anything KubeCon related, so presentations or demo related. So if you want to join that, feel free to do that. All right. Any questions or comments about the demo or KubeCon in general? Okay, I guess I should say for KubeCon in general, the slide decks are out here. So the links are all in this section. Um, honestly, I don't think most of them have a whole lot of content yet. I know some people have been starting to add content. Um, but if, if you're so inclined, take a look at what's there today. If you have comments about um, the direction people are going, please feel free to add comments in there or send out notes to the mailing list or whatever. Um, I believe, uh, I'm trying to remember. If the, I can't remember when the deadline is. Unfortunately, I can't remember when it is. The deadline actually may be this week or next week <clears throat> for actually officially sending it in. But of course, people tend to wait the last minute anyway. Um, but please do your reviews sooner rather than later if, you, if you're interested in sort of monitoring that. And again, we will have a call, phone call today after this one if you want to join that conversation. Any questions about that? All right, KubeCon uh, China. Uh, we do have a 35 minute session for cloud events and a 35 minute for serverless. Um, I personally will be there. I suspect Kathy might be there since, um, since that's close to Huawei. But anybody else going to be there who's interested in speaking, please let me know. I'm basically looking for speakers at this point in time. Um, anybody and everybody's willing or is, is, a, is welcome to, to volunteer. I'll take anything I get at this point. And um, what, what, what dates? What are the dates? Uh, what are the dates? It's in it's in June. Let me see if I can find that on a second. It is the week of June twenty fourth. Okay. Next up, I'll put that in here. Hold on a minute. That all, that's always helpful for finding volunteers to know when that is. Yeah, that's true. Okay, there we go. Um. What, what else? Oh, yeah. So yearly review um, next week. I'm going to be giving a presentation to the TOC on how we're doing with cloud events. While the presentation is there, there's nothing in there. So don't bother looking yet. Um, hopefully before end of the weekend, I'll have something there for you guys to review. And I'll send out a note for you guys to comment on it. I think May 7th is Tuesday. So there's not a whole lot of time. Um, but I will at least send it out. Um, before the end of the weekend for you guys to take a look at it. I don't expect it to be anything controversial, so hopefully it's not a big deal. And with that, I think we can jump into PRs, unless there are other topics people would like to bring up that I'm forgetting about. Um, do we plan to say we have free independent users to go for the next level? Uh, oh, I wasn't gonna bring that up on the TOC call on Tuesday. Rather, on Tuesday, I was gonna bring up the topic of what do they mean by three independent users for a project like ours, which is just a spec. And um, oh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know whether they're, they're going to be able to answer that question, but at least we can start the discussion on Tuesday. And then, obviously, <clears throat> based upon that discussion, we can decide whether we want to go forward to be an incubator project or not. Okay. All right. I mean, we can already look if we have like free independent users, in our opinion, right? I mean, at least we yeah. get commerce tools. We use it a bit, or like some of our customers use the implementation with Event Grid. Okay, yeah. that, that would be good to know. I, that's a very good point, because worst case scenario is they say end user means end user of a product that's using cloud events. And if you already have end users using it, and, um, and we can you know, 
confidently say that 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 they're real and they're not just made up. I'm not sure you have to actually have to have names. Then yeah, we could probably satisfy that requirement. So if you have that information, send it to me, and I'll I'll definitely include that as part of the discussions going forward. Oh, all right, I'll do. Okay, thank you. And I'd say that's true for everybody, not just uh, Christoph. All right, cool. Let's get into some PRs. Do, 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 do. Okay, first one, hopefully relatively easy. It already has a couple of LGTMs. So this one, a couple of things. Um, this is strictly a reordering of the spec. I noticed that the attributes we had were in sort of a random order. They weren't even alphabetical or required first or anything like that. And I'm, in some of the discussions I'm having with some people relative to supporting cloud events, um, I thought it'd be useful if we grouped the required attributes together just so that there's a section that says basically, you know, here's the bare minimum you need to support to become a cloud event. And that's the required attributes. Everything else is optional. So that's basically what I did is I created a required attributes section, put all the attributes that are required to be implemented or supported in there, alphabet, alphabet, um, alphabetical. And then I created a, doo -doo 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 -doo, where is it? Um, where's my optional section? Oh, there we go. Then I create an optional attribute section and put all the other attributes in there in alphabetical order. Um, obviously excluding the data section, which has a, or the data attribute, which has its own section, because I was always pulled out. I did not make any other typographical changes whatsoever, or definitely not semantic changes either. I just reordered things around and created two, two new sections. Any questions on that? Any objections to approving that? Okay, cool. Thank you guys. All right. Is Klaus on the call? Yes, you are good. Okay, Klaus. Yes, I just joined. Yep, cool. So on last week's call, we actually approved this PR. However, afterwards, there was a couple of questions that were raised that um, made it clear that maybe we should ha have a little bit of a further, a further discussion on this topic. So Klaus, I'll let you go ahead and drive this discussion. Okay, so um, in order to uh, later on come up with this other PR regarding the immutability of event context, I uh, felt that I need some more terms, like for example, the intermediary um, to, to better achieve this. So, and, and, and then I stepped over, I, I maybe also need a consumer. Then I saw that source and producer are not really defined. I mean, source, the attribute is defined, but we are in, in many places of the document uh, talking about uh, producer, um, but it's not really defined so far. And uh, well, what I came up with was that distinction between source and producer, so that the producer is the entity that actually puts together this um, data structure or data record um, that is then put on the wire um, um, transporting the event, while the source is more the, the logical source of the event, like um, could, for example, be a business process or I don't know, a lot of things. Um, later on then uh, some others in the call stepped over <laughs> a logical inconsistency so that this source definition does not really um, fit to the source attribute. And uh, there's some, some discussion what exactly source is and then producer. Um, I think uh, the attribute is defined as the source as describing the producer. So uh, basically defining source by referring to something else that hasn't been defined yet. Mm, yeah, so uh, there were some discussions what exactly a source can be, if it exactly is something very specific like uh, a process or um, I don't know, or if it really is something logical as I have put it here and, and what then is the producer. So, um, I meanwhile I also have um, done some research. Uh, there is a book uh, available. Um, I think it's event processing in action or something on Manning. Uh, they also define terms like producer and source. And that's uh, again, a bit different. So I don't know. The, the 
I like the distinction that you make here because the source might really be a, a different system that's emitting some, some event that is not yet in, in cloud events form. And then the cloud event is produced by the producer. But if you have some kind of device that's talking uh, Modbus or something, that's probably the source. And then you have the producer, like tr truly, and then you have the producer is the one that's creating the cloud event. So, so Klaus, did this text that I'm looking at right here, did that change from last week? Or is it still no. the same? No, I, I think there was something, um, or some clarification I, I'm still, uh, I still supposed to make. Um, wondering where it was. It's somewhere about an external producer, I think it was. I didn't do it yet because um, I think the, the whole uh, definition was uh, under discussion. So I um, didn't add that single word. I think Evan put it into in the um, comments a bit above. I'm trying to remember. Oh, here we go. Was this, yeah, here it was, an external producer in the example, I think it was. So when I, I yeah. yeah. So that's so what that, I'm willing to make, of course, but at first I would like to see if the direction overall is correct. Or uh, people can agree on this. I, I, I think that we need to uh, consolidate this terminology with what's in the primer as well, because for that intermediary, we use the term middleware. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and so I think we should uh, think about that and be consistent across the, those documents. I think in other places also, I'm not sure if in the primer, but somewhere I also have seen uh, intermediary, but yeah, should be consolidated, agree. Yep, I think I were able to agree with that, Mark. Thank you, yep. So Tapini, I think you had made some comments either after last week's call or in the issue here or in the PR here. Did you want to jump in here and, and say something sure um by the way the change was yeah just external producer creates the cloud event uh, that was suggested by me last week um the big thing the bigger thing was something i realized while I was writing a comment on pr 391 i don't even remember what it was about now i think the change to event id and source or something uh, no, it was changed to the actual attributes to, to distinct to get some clarification around the event ID uniqueness. Anyway, um, the the problem is pretty well spelled out in my comment on this PR. If you can pull it out, yep. Hold on a sec. There um, you go. The basic gist of it is that source is now. Oops. Sorry. Defined here differently from um, how it is used as an attribute. So the attribute is defined as having both identifying information about the organization and the component emitting the event, but also some unique IDs, for example, for a file container in a cloud storage solution. So, but this document instead defines source as a logical system. So that would be, for example, the whole, um, to me, that implies the whole, uh, for example, cloud storage solution or program instead of the individual file container. So when someone's talking about a source, it now feels unambiguous as to which what they are referring to the value of the source attribute or to the source as defined in this terminology. And I find that they are in conflict and I gave multiple examples in this comment. If, if we were to use a different term in the terminology section, would that alleviate the concern? Yes, if we did have, so this is, I, I was going to ask Klaus what the book defined. <laughs> because it feels like this should be a solved problem. Because okay, so in, in the book, um, I think they also had a producer, a consumer, and in addition, processor. And the source was then always that entity that actually created the event. So a consumer a producer was uh, at the edge of the uh, event processing system, how they call this. And a processor was part of that event processing system, and both could 
in fact be sources. So that's how they put it. And it's again a different view. <laughs> so Oh, okay. So well well actually they just they pretty much have them swapped around from what this terminology now says. In this terminology, the source is the edge. It's the system the event comes from, and the producer is the technical component producing events. So Unlike produ producer is more um, to distinguish from something that is part of the event processing system uh, for them. But as we don't have something like this, this event processing system, and I'm not sure if it's um, suitable for us as we ha have those those cloud interoperability scenarios. Um, I don't know if that pr definition is really helpful for us. That is true. Um, but anyway, I, I like the source attributes um, definition as having like also defining the not only the logical system the event comes from, for example, a user service, but also the domain or the or more uh, granular source. For example, a user account or a user address, if you did some. <clears throat> exactly, this, this example with the domain was what I was thinking of, because I think one of the favorite examples always is, uh, are the GitHub events. And the source is then github.com slash something, and maybe not the specific host actually emitting the event. So. So. Tim asked a question in the chat and I actually raised my hand because I was, I had a similar thought yesterday and forgive me, Tim, if I'm going to misstate what you were thinking, but from a spec perspective, do all the various roles matter? Now, I understand that when we talk about things, it's useful to have common terminology just so that we're on the same page, but does it matter whether the producing side of a cloud event is one entity versus 10 different entities and do we actually need to give names to everything or should the spec be a little bit more abstract and just say something's going to produce something on a transport and this is what that something needs to look like well uh, we had this discussion about the event context and uh, the immutability and there was i think some strong feeling that uh, at least middleware shouldn't just drop for example optional attributes uh, and then and that on the other hand, if you consume an event and really produce a new one, then you're of course free to do um, whatever you like. Uh, so that's what led me to this distinction. Yeah, but do we actually need to call out as detailed the distinction as that? For example, in the case where there's a piece of middleware that may or may not be modifying things, could we not just say that if that if there's a component that takes in a cloud event and then generates a cloud event, depending on what it's doing, it may or may not modify the thing, the, the, the data in there and whether that's okay or not. Do we have to actually get into the details of defining the various roles? Do we actually have any examples of middleware that's transparent that modifies the cloud event? I'm trying to figure out how that would work. So one example I was thinking of related to this and um, also the definition of source attribute is, for example, um, ingesting application specific events into a larger system um, as the source allows and in my opinion must allow application specific identifiers which might not be globally unique, um, you might actually have to have a middleware that augments the source to include a, um, let's say, a DNS component or a DNS, uh, DNS unique component to the source for which was um, because the source was previously application specific, but not unique enough in a global context. Let me rephrase the question. Is there any particular value in keeping source and type the same when you go and need to modify an event in this way. Oh, okay. Um, you know, if you said, hey, when you do this, you have to put in a new type or a new source. Um, w are there middleware cases that would be harmed? I, I would think if you have a piece of middleware that's acting more like a proxy, yeah. you might. But then yeah. it's not adding fields, right? 
it could in the same way an HTTP proxy could add some fields just so you know that it existed and where you know how it, came, how it went through that system. Didn't we have this, oh. this discussion last week about the um, Kafka partition something? Yes, and, and also open tracing. Like this whole tracing stuff is um, basically morphing, ch changing the, the the content of the the tracing attribute as it passes through uh, uh, infrastructure. So there, there is stuff that's being modified on the way where you want to preserve most of the, uh, the source event, but then as it flows through multiple layers of, of infrastructure, there is stuff that's being added or, um, or changed. I think tracing may be, I, I haven't looked at the implementation of open tracing, but um, Tracing may be an example, but it seems like in most of these cases, you care whether it's been transformed by the middleware or not. So in some sense, if you got the original event instead of the in enriched one, you'd be upset. Yeah, I, the, the tracing, th think, of, think of tracing as annotations. The, the, um, here, this isn't, isn't becoming as clear as it is in some other mappings of the tracing stuff. Um, like an MQP, we make that pretty clear. But um, it's like the the way how open tracing works is basically that's a that's an ongoing annotation as you go from hop to hop to hop, where you basically create a bre breadcrumb trail, and there it is pretty apparent that you have to go and modify it, the 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 message as it flows through, even though um, you're not changing anything about the semantics of that event. So th that case exists. You you would be upset if you you would be upset if you would materially change the event semantically, and in that case, I agree I agree that that should cause uh, a different event being created that is then somehow coupled traced back to whatever the original event is, and that might that might be a rule that you have to go and refer to include whatever the original event. Uh, not, not, one, not one that we have to go and define here because that starts to then go into, that would be too complicated for me, for my taste. So I'm trying to figure out if there's any guidance we can give to the class on this one. <laughs> I mean, I do think, yeah, sorry. No, go, I, go ahead, Spini. I, I do think that we need to define something uh, at least for a producer because it is used extensively in the attribute definitions and it is a bit confusing if we don't define it in any way because at least previously there have been multiple uses of it or <laughs> uses in multiple different ways uh, and that might cause confusion. So, uh, Kathy, I'll get to you in a second. I just want to clarify. clarify. So, Tapini, if we had just this definition of producer and completely got rid of this source section, would Not that be a bad thing? Yes, because then, then the event ID, no, the event source um, attribute definition no longer holds because it says that you must uh, set a distinct source attribute value for each distinct producer. And that would be in conflict with the definition of producer here at the moment. I guess if you if you um, remove the current definition of producer in this PR altogether and just define what define the value of the source attribute and this producer as the same thing then you would get a coherent definition, but that is not very useful because then you have the attribute source is reflecting something we define as a producer and that makes no sense. Okay, uh, Kathy, your hands up. You know, yeah, I, I share the same thought. I think we have two fields like source and producer. If we define two, right? We have to clearly define, you know, the difference and how to represent them. I think if we define one, it's, it's clearer, you know, for example, the producer, it's very clear what we mean. And then we can also, I think we also need to add, you know, the type for the producer, how we represent it in the, in the other section. 
same for consumer and intermediary. Intermediary. Trying to figure out what to do with all this. <laughs> Heinz, what's your current thinking? I'm sorry, not Heinz, uh, Klaus, sorry. So um, I, I think around source, there's still some perceived um, uncertainty. I, I also realized that while discussing it in the um, Canadian event registry, um, so um, I mean, it, it has some some implications if you if you do um, source uh, very specific, basically as describing the producer edit is defined here, or if you um, think it's it's more a logical identifier of where it, where the event comes from. Uh, also, with regards to the granularity of or, or how to handle subscriptions and so on. So I'm thinking, you know, if we want to define both producer and source. So producer, I think is very cl is clear, at least to me, what it means, right? And consumer, you already have a consumer, you have a producer. So what's the use of the source? What, what purpose does it serve? We define each one. And then we need to clearly identify the difference between producer and the source. So in which case we need this source. If we have a scenario say in addition to producer we also need this source attribute then we can add that source and clearly define its scope which will be different from the producer even the representation will be different but if we cannot clearly define that i think putting it there will cause more confusion than you know giving any benefit so, so Kathy, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Are you are you suggesting that maybe we don't actually have source as a standalone term, rather, as part of the definition of producer, we talk about how the producer is the creator of the cloud event for an event source, and just leave it almost like that, and not actually try to define it as a separate entity. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, I think basically that's right. So I'm thinking we unless we can clearly define source and identify, you know, it's, it's, it's a needed field to serve some specific scenario. I think for producer, I, I feel it is, it's enough, it's good, and we can clearly define it, what that producer means. Then there's a, there's a producer, there will be a consumer, right? If we're, it, we're going to define the consumer, then I think it makes sense to define a producer. But what's that source for? What's a, what purpose does it serve? Right. Is it to paint your hands up and then Doug? Yeah, I just want to comment that if we do do that, I, I'm not objecting to that, but um, then the event, at, at least the source attribute uh, definition will have to be rewritten because it talks about producer in, in an incompatible way. Okay, I'll yes, I, I think currently these two are not quite clear, the source and producer. Uh, Doug, I'll, I'll look for um, that attribute. Do you want to speak next? Uh, yes, the uh, <clears throat> I work with uh, GS1 on their um, event format that's used mostly for um, location tracking and product, and uh, they're extending into sensors, and so they they have two two elements where the source could be the uh, you know, identifier of the sensor, you know, an IoT, and then um, the, uh, the gateway would be the producer that would be um, semantically an annotating what the sensor produced. All right. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's also, the, that is the scenario that I also had in mind when I spoke up last, is that is an IoT actually fairly common is that you have devices which are which are connected through radio or through field bus or whatever, which are not sp speaking I even IP, and which ha don't have the bandwidth to go and, and put something on the wire, where you if you want to have something that is the producer and that that identify that now needs to go and and identify it towards an infrastructure with its own identity etc. To be able to go and send events that is distinct from 
the source of events that it acts on behalf of. So I, I'm in favor of having really two distinct um, concepts here, um, really along the lines of what Klaus has in this document here, because that is the distinction that certainly in the IoT space uh, people use. So Tapini, am I correct that it is this short sentence here that I've highlighted is really the problem sentence? Yeah, indeed, that, that is the problematic piece. I agree. Okay. So if we were to do the equivalent of basically kill that sentence and maybe do a little bit of wordsmithing on the rest of oh, it, it sounds like... Also the last sentence. Um, well, actually, no, wait. No, that isn't so problematic. The event producer, although it isn't the actual logical system inside that is defined in the source, it can certainly define the syntax and semantics. That That's yeah. fine, sorry. Okay. No so yeah, so we can maybe do a little bit where we're at, but basically get rid of that first sentence. Mm -hmm. If we did that, is what's in here bad? Well, there's still the conflict between that source attribute value and the source as defined here. It, it that That fixes the problem with the producer versus source attribute, but it doesn't fix the problem between the source term as defined here and the source attribute. It, my comment in the PR still holds even if we remove that uh, that sentence from the start of the attribute definition. So, so somehow we have to consolidate the fact that this is talking about logical systems or services and the source attribute is also talking about identifiers within that logical system. Yeah. The, the thing that matters here is really the source, which means the context for the event and what, what that event really, the context that the event describes, because that's ultimately what source means. Um, and the producer doesn't play much of a role, really. Um, other than being the one that's formulating the event and then in the case of middleware, having a relationship with, you know, the first publishing point. Um, but that's really all role that it has. So in our, in our specification per se, the producer doesn't really have much of a role in the design spec that would implement, in, would implement our spec, it would have a bigger role because then it needs to be, you know, then it has an actual actual relationship with with whatever the intermediary is, but but our higher order bit here is the source. So, uh, to, to, to Pini, is this sentence I've highlighted the problem sentence? That, but also these. So so the whole definition is actually problematic. But from what Clemens just said, I propose that or, or something along the lines of not talking about logical systems, but actually the context of what you talk about Clemens that's actually what makes sense and what the attribute that what the attribute that we have describes it, it describes the context in which the event happened with the identifiers and everything so this ter term should just be redefined as what we use as the source attribute in my in my opinion then then the producer can stay defined as is it just plays a lot smaller role in the spec for example, some things are producer defined, but that's just left to the reader of the spec to decide what that means, and that's fine. But the source here should be defined in the same way as that attribute is, otherwise we're in trouble. So if we just said the source is the context in which the event happened, it stopped at that? Describes, describes the context in which the event happened. I, I would be fine with that. Anybody else have any comments? Kathy, is your hand old or is that a new hand? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just okay. thinking, you know, um, unless we can clearly define these two, um, maybe another way we can combine them, you know, and put that, you know, context or whatever we want to define the source into, you know, put them, I mean, combine them so, so that people will not be confused. Well, I, I think we did just define them quite clearly. Producer is producing events, source is the context in which that event happened. They are two very distinct things. Okay, uh, Tim, your hands up. I wanted to say I love that phrase, context in which the event happens. I fully intend to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, Doug, your hands up. Uh, so, um, Doug, you had added a, a cause 
attribute for KubeCon demo. And so when you're starting to describe source the way you just did, it seems like there's there's overlap with that cause attribute. Um, slightly different. And our for the demo, cause is more like a related to ID more than anything else. It's not really the, the source of the event per se. It's, it's which other cloud event is this one related to? So it's slightly different, but I can understand why it, you can kind of view it that way. So we are technically, I think, out of time on this one because I did try to, I wanted to time box this. However, I do think at the end there, we may have actually come to a, a possible direction. Um, Klaus, would you agree? Yes, uh, I wasn't never really happy with this logical system phrase, but I didn't, uh, wasn't able to come up with something else. So this uh, context uh, phrase, I, I love, so it's yeah. great. <laughs> okay, so it seems like maybe it's modifying this as we just talked about, and then also modifying this a little, like maybe even just get rid of that, that sentence right there. We maybe have a direction that people can consider. Does that sound right? question so i'm going to define the type of how to represent the producer in the following section or we just define source so we do not define the producer is there a need for a field for producer can you think of one mm. i'm not sure yet but i'm just thinking you know we define this so what's a Kathy, are you talking about adding another field to the cloud event spec called producer? No, I'm just thinking whether we need to define, you know, anything. So we have a terminology here, right? Mm -hmm. The producer, right? Is there a need? We should define how to like identify this producer. How we, is there a need if we need to access this? I think Tapini's question is the right one is, do we have a use case that actually needs it? And then, then we can talk about it in more concrete terms. Just because I, I can't come up with any reason I would want to know the actual bit running machine that produced the event. I just want to define the producer, but I don't actually care about it after I have that event. I care about the source, but I don't care about which machine actually created the event. That should be handled by tracing or something. Okay, but we'll think about that, Kathy. If you can if you think of some use cases where it might be useful, then I think it'd be an interesting discussion to have. But within the context of this, I do feel like we have a possible direction to go forward. So Klaus, you okay with taking another pass at, at the changes here? Yes, um, I just wonder if I need source in the terminology section if we, um, I just adjust the um, field, uh, the attributes definition. I, I think okay. it would be replicated at least uh, yeah. Anybody have any opinion on that? Personally, I'm in favor of con consolidating, if you can. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me. No, I, I don't think there are many uses outside the source attribute for the term. So in that, that sense, I think it should be consolidated. But if you can just like <laughs> search through the spec, where are we using the term source? And if there's a lot of uses, then it should be defined separately, I think, as well. Okay. okay. So I can, I, I think that the term producer might be used in, in many places and maybe not always in line with this definition. But yeah. yeah. I think there's a need to just go through all of the uses of source, producer, consumer, and intermediary, like when we are adding this terminology so that they are not in conflict with the users. Right. Okay, and I think with that, we're gonna have to call it time, even though we're way over 15 minutes. Uh, okay. The only other thing I'll say is to address Mark's comment earlier about making sure we get alignment with the primer and other documents, I'm assuming we can do that as a follow-on piece of work um, once we get this definition nailed down. So I don't think, I don't think class, you have to do everything at once. I think we can do it in stages. Okay. All right, with that, let's move forward to optional event ID. Uh, I don't believe, I think this is from Alan, right? Yeah, I don't believe Alan is on the call and I don't think he can make it. However, the general idea here is he wants ID 
Is this right? Yeah, he basically wants ID to be optional because he has some systems that do not need it and it's very costly for him to actually produce it in all cases. So I wanted to bring up the discussion here and see if there's a general direction the group can agree upon. Um, in particular, let me get his last comment. If we, because Clemens made, a, made an argument for keeping it because we're actually operating at a different level. And here was uh, Alan's response back to that. I'll let you guys read that very quickly. But Tim, um, I would tend to agree. I believe that Alan was saying that in some cases, for him anyway, UUIDs are not cheap. I just don't know whether, who, who to believe on that one, to be honest. So anyway, I'll let you read his comments here. Okay, let me open it up for discussion. <laughs> what do people think about making it optional? Because right now it is required in the spec. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's good business, Tim. <laughs> uh, so what do people think? I don't understand his argument. Um, because it's like, I don't understand the case where you would not want to make it unique. Like there's a, it seems like Alan tries to make a case where there is a uh, case where you would explicitly not want to make it unique, which is a little strange to me. And then there was another, there was an argu another argument made that is in the bug that, where this comes from, where it's like, it might be, it, there might be sufficient information inside of the event to make it unique. And, and I agree with that, uh, that there might be, but the point is to further, and that was um, uh, the counter argument um, that, you know, we want to have an interoperable way of ensuring uniqueness and that's by introducing that field. So even if you have four fields that taken together, you know, create uniqueness, um, then the way how to make this interoperable is to put the concatenate them and put them into a field where everybody can go and pick them up because the duplication was is kind of the, the guiding uh, um, scenario it seems like that was made in this thread. But there are also cases where you want to go and take a bunch of events and store them in a database so you can go and and um, and look at them later. And for that, you need to have at least a primary key in addition to whatever keys you want to for lookup. And, uh, and that is um, the combination of source and, um, and event ID is what we identified for that. Time was another factor that was suggested. And of course, clocks are terrible and you do create things in parallel and there's timer resolution. And if you compensate for clock skew, then your clock may actually go backwards, et cetera, et cetera. So that's not a good criteria, not good a way, not a good way to go and create uniqueness. And as Tim wrote, UUIDs are cheap. So I, I'm not sure what the, what the problem is. Okay. And I'm also saying a whole bunch of negative ones to make it optional in the chat. So thank you guys very much for speaking up. <clears throat> I appreciate that. So let me ask this question. Is there anybody on the call who would, would agree with Alan that we should make it optional, even in the slightest? Just to throw a wrench in there. Um, oh, you yeah. said UUIDs are cheap. <laughs> they are cheap, but you might not be able to guarantee a very strong uniqueness in some embedded scenarios. You might not have a lot of entropy. But you have a you have a source that is scoping the ID, which means there you can go and and just you know keep keep a keep a, a number that is monotonically increasing, and store that locally. Your counter. Yeah, so I'm not hearing anybody jump up and down and say they want to keep it or or, or change it to be optional. Is that a, is that a fair assessment? Okay. I don't think there's any point in us dwelling on this since I don't hear anybody on the call willing to advocate for Alan's position. However, I, um, what I'd like to do is go back to Alan and say, basically, no one else wants this change. However, if you can come on next week's call to make a case for it beyond what you've already said in the issue, you know, we're willing to give you some time to, to talk about it. But barring that, it sounds like the, 
the will of the group is to close this this PR and and keep the, the spec the way it is. Is that an accurate representation? Are you guys okay with that direction? Yes. Sure. He said in the last comment he made two hours ago that he can't make it today, but he will add it back to his calendar because it fell off. So I guess he right. can be. Right. That's that's what I was hoping. I didn't want I didn't want to just close this without giving him a chance to speak for himself as. Um, uh, in real time, as opposed to through comments. Because I think he does feel passionate about this and I don't want to miss out something if there's something he hasn't said in, in the comments there. So, okay, let, let's do that and see if he can come to the call. Otherwise, I don't think it's worth our time dwelling on it here since we all seem to be in agreement, I think. Okay, so let's get to this one. Now, to, 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 as of right now, just to refresh everybody's memory, basically source plus ID defines uniqueness and Scott, you are still there, right? Yes, Scott. I believe on last week's call, you were gonna go off and think about some of the discussions we had last week in terms of whether you were coming around to saying, okay, ID is sufficient for uniqueness, at least within the scope of, of a producer. Have you had a chance to think more about that? Scott, is your mic not working again? Uh oh, he's having issues. Okay, let's give him a sec. Well, I look forward to see what the next issue is. Unfortunately, the next issue involves Scott as well. You think ID is okay, okay. Is there anybody, okay, so in that case, it sounds like um, we need to go back and just review Alan's PR here, because I'm, I'm pretty sure this PR pretty much just says source plus ID needs to be unique. And oh, because we spent so much- Sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. There's great examples, new examples on source. I think the clarification of source is really good in this one. Yep. Yep. So I don't want to try to close this one because I think enough people have kind of ignored this one while we went back and forth on whether ID is sufficient, that I want people to have another week to review this. But otherwise, this PR, I believe, is ready to go. And I do believe that um, probably can... That's right, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask... Um, the definition of source here seems like it's prior to the addition of subject. Um, the internet wide unique URIs seem a little bit strange um, for GitHub, where I'd expect some part of that to be in subject instead. But I can follow up on the issue. Yeah. That. I think that's a great comment, Evan. Yeah, if you could put a comment in there and maybe Alan can make some changes here accordingly, because you're probably right. I think this was, was probably originally written before subject. Hey, can I still comment on that? Because I don't think that that's true. Because, if, if, for example, for GitHub pull requests, um, I would expect, for example, a comment to have that that example as the source and the subject to be something about the comment. But maybe I'm wrong. But our, our experience has been that usually you're interested in like all pull requests on the cloud event spec, for example. Um, and it's nice to have that in a field where you can do a match that's not complex. Correct. So that's, that's, true. That's, that's true. where I'm coming from there in terms of usability. So Evan, I wanna make sure I understand. Are you saying that basically in this example, uh, this that I've highlighted would be the source, but then the pull slash one, two, three would be the subject? Uh, the more pull one, two, three, hashtag comment, blah, something like that potentially is the subject. But right. I'm saying that having the source be somewhat more consistent is helpful for many routing scenarios. We, if we scroll down in the, uh, the, the subject actually discusses that. Oh, there we go. Or at least it did. <laughs> Yeah, the, it's not expanded, so you can't read it right now, I guess. Um, you oh, wait. click on the little oh, funny sorry. arrows. Sorry, I got, I got confused. I was looking in the wrong section. Sorry. And there's still a little bit left, but it's like 10 lines. So There we go. Yeah, see, there's, there's a discussion in the, in the example. Okay. Well, it sounds like we're all heading in the right direction. It may just need some minor twiddling to the to the um, to the examples, and maybe we can work that offline through comments. 
Does that sound fair? Okay, sure. Kathy. I was wrong in my okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Kathy, your hands up. Yeah, I, I see here, you know, definition of the source and producer is mixed in this here. Uh, which section are you referring to? Um, let me see. Did you, can you scroll up? I, mm -hmm. I saw something before. So here is the identifies the event producer. This is source definition, right? Yeah, we're and talking also, about, yeah, we're going to remove also, that. Yeah, and also it mentioned, you know, the process that produced the, the event. So based on previous discussion, looks like this should be the producer, right? Well, so, okay. So I believe that this text right here, for the most part, is untouched in this PR. So whatever uh, Klaus comes up with for new text, we'll probably replace this if he touches this text. Oh, I see. Because I saw there's a minus and plus, so I'm, you know. Yeah, and no, I think that's just reformatting, I think. Oh, okay. I, um, I could imagine yeah, the most part. it identifies the context in which the event has been created or something like this. Yeah. Instead of identifies the event producer, right? Yeah, I think I think just formatting this is the biggest okay. change there. I think this is the new the beginning of the new stuff more than anything else. Uh, Cassie did make a good point in that the the specific part of the first paragraph, the process that produced the event, that is also in conflict. So, yeah. Well. It depends on how you define event, right? Is it cloud oh, event? Or oh is my it... God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'll let Klaus worry about that. <laughs> is it... Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I think if you guys can make your comments on, um, on the examples in here, I think we can make some progress and maybe I'll get this one resolved next week because I don't think we're really all headed in different directions. I think we all go are headed in the same direction. It's just minor tweaks at this point. Okay. And Scott, you can't come off mute yet, can you? Maybe. Maybe. Yes. Excellent. If you do want to talk to this one, we only have like three minutes. Uh, don't use okay. quotes. Don't use quotes. <laughs> okay. Um, I th did you want to talk about any of the proposals that were, because you made some changes in here. And I think you and I aren't necessarily too far off in the sense that ignoring maps for a minute for pretty much all other attributes, I think you and I are both saying treat everything as a string, right? Yes, but only for the cloud event context and extensions. Right, not data and I'm not even necessarily maps yet, just the other attributes. Exactly. Right, and so what I wanted to quickly get a sense from the group is whether you guys think that's an okay direction to go. Um, I believe right now integer is the only other type that we actually define in that inside of a spec. So I think we basically end up dropping the entire notion of types and then figure out what to do with maps later. But everything basically just says it's a string and, and, and to serialize it, however strings normally get serialized in whatever transport you guys are, are sending this over. What do people think about a general direction like that? Clement, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was waiting for that. Um, <laughs> let me think about it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. In that case, I don't think that's people, someone can think of another topic to bring up in like two minutes, which I don't think we ever can do. Let me go back and just do a quick roll call. Um, Dan Barker, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. Uh, Javier, are you there? Yes. Okay. Is there anybody else that I missed for attendance? I think I have everybody else. Okay. In that case, you guys are free to go unless you want to join the um, KubeCon EU slash demo talk immediately following this one in three minutes. But thank you guys very much. I know we uh, dove deep on some issues, but I think it was all, all good discussion. So I think we made some progress. Thanks, right. guys. Thanks, Doug. Yep. Thanks, so. Yep. Clemens, you're going to stay on, I assume, right? Uh, I will. Okay, good. Because the reason I'm picking on you is because I know in the past you mentioned that you were going to do an implementation. I want to make sure you saw the latest stuff. And 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, be away for exactly three minutes as I'm listening to a message, but I'll be right back. Okay, sounds good. We got time anyway. Do do do. Okay, it's 1 p.m., but I'll give people one more minute before we get started. This time, hey, wait a minute. We lost Scott. Let me ping him. Do, 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 do. I have returned. All right, cool. Well, let me ping Scott because I think he's the only other person who might have actually had running code recently. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Okay, let's do the easy stuff first. Relative to KubeCon itself, uh, for the presentations and stuff, I know that some people have been putting in some slide information. Um, are there any topics people want to bring up there? Um, any questions, concerns you'll have, or is it just a matter of finding time to fill out the, uh, the, the slide deck? Uh, you regarding the slides? Can we do them in PowerPoint? <laughs> you know, I honestly don't care, um, other than I think having someplace, to, well, actually, that's this question. Does Microsoft have the ability, or I'm sorry, does Microsoft Online, does Office Online have the ability for uh, random people to make comments? For random people to make comments? You mean yeah. for, anon for anonymous contributors? Yeah, not necessarily make edits, but add comments. Uh, that I don't know, but I can go and find out whether that's a feature of, so it, it's either OneDrive, so I think if I, if I give you an edit link on OneDrive, everybody can, can edit it who has the edit link. Okay. Yes. Anything is better than Google 
presentation sheets. It's like whatever. <laughs> okay, I personally I, don't care what we use as long as it's shareable by everybody. Because Vlad, Vlad had the objection also in like, oh, I don't know how to do this a Google Docs thing and we're kind of one the same in that one. Okay, I, honestly, I don't care. Um, if you guys want to switch over to, to Microsoft Office Live or whatever it's called, I'm okay with that. I, I don't care. Okay, great. So if, if Clem, uh, Clemens, if you can take the action item though to set I'll, it up. Yeah, I would, I, will, I have my, I will put this on my personal public OneDrive, which is the easiest thing. And there's the online thing. And then we can also edit on the, in the app, depending on how you want it. I can send everybody a discount code. <laughs> okay. Um, so hold on one second. There is, <clears throat> where is it? Somewhere in my notes is the link to the actual PowerPoint slide deck that we're supposed to be using. Let me see if I can find that. Oh, because you're telling me if the original is actual PowerPoint? Yes. Doug, what are you doing to me? I, I, I thought Google Doc was the easiest, but that's fine. <laughs> hold on. Um, where is this darn? Wait, this is Glass Coupon China. Hold on. China. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I don't want to waste your time. I'll find it offline. Um, but there okay. is a there is a real PowerPoint, and I'll send that to you. And then if you can get that set up, I don't mind switching. That's fine. Okay. So anything else relative to the slide decks for um, KubeCon EU that we want to talk about? Please look over my proof concept example. I still think I think it's a bit too small. But then again, initially it was bigger and I spent like 15 minutes of the 15 minutes I had explaining it and that was not fun. So I really want to start working on it this weekend. So I'll need a couple of eyes on it. It's basically a, a, a blender with tracing done by Honeycomb, which is going to be put in an extension. So it's nothing too big and I will be reluctant to make it bigger because again, I don't want to spend like half of the time explaining a convoluted demo. So and yeah. It, 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 when you talk about reviewing something, is that the note that you sent or did you put something into the, into the slide deck? I fought with Google slide stuff for an hour and I managed to put stuff in there. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> okay, so I assume it's this presentation right here, right? Okay. Yeah, I think. Okay, let's, let's just double check. One that has slides. Check, check, check. Uh, yes, this is it. It's there. Okay. That's okay. the email I posted. Slide five should have should have had another logo, but Google she doesn't understand SVGs. <laughs> and if you scroll down, there's two, 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 yeah slide eleven, I think it is. Like this is the very very high level. Didn't implement anything. Uh, I don't, proof of concept diagram. It's basically gonna wait for uh, two events to come. The events come, they're processed on some kind of gate. They go through a lambda that deploys to EKS using Helm because Zonzo needs compliance and you can do really nice stuff with lambda and EKS due to the way AWS does authentication. The cloud events thing here is again saying, hey, cloud events are here, they're boring, use them. And I'm gonna be using extensions for Honeycomb context propagation. Again, this might change as soon as I start implementing it because I might have imagined it wrong, but uh, an early review would be good. Okay, so everybody, when you get a chance, please review that before the end of the weekend. Or be more careful. Yeah, okay. Anything else relative to coupon then? All righty, let's jump over to the demo. All right, so Doug, um, I wanted to quickly ask you the question I asked through Slack. And I know you responded, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. My biggest question was just, this, this is a good example, right? So the trigger for someone to know whether they're supposed to do something or not is they look at the source, the type, which are both cloud event attributes, but then here they have to actually go into the data um, to figure out whether it's something that they care about. Would it be horrible if we were to create uh, either two new extensions 
for this information to go as cloud event properties or potentially even modify an existing property, like for example, order to be just order dot order released. If we make those types of changes, is that going to break the model that we're trying to adhere to? Um, not, not if you separate them into two additional elements. Um, if you put, tried to put it into type, then it would break the model because there's three, you know, there's the attribute value pairs that are currently in the data attribute. And if you just separated, if you took the attribute identifier, which is tied to, you know, the semantic model, um, and he put that into its own element, you know, call it attribute or property. And then you left, you left data to just be the value of that attribute and that works. But then what we, the way, um, uh, that we're using data currently is that we're, it's supporting multiple attribute value pairs asso associated with the one subject um, within one cloud event, right? So that you can take that cloud event, go into data and see everything that uh, you would need in order to conditionally react to it. And if you took attribute into a separate, you know, if you took a, you know, if you separated attribute and value, then you would have a, a separate cloud event for each one of those, which then you would have to be able to look at a, a collection of cloud events before you could react. Well, so wait, no, wait. Uh, um, I think maybe some confusion here, and I don't know whether it's on your side or my side. Let, let me ask you a question about this field right here, type equals order. <clears throat> Um, if cloud event, if cloud events did not exist and you guys just said, here is a, um, here is a, uh, what's the, what's the acronym I'm looking for? The, um, ARIS? No. Um, ACRIS. If I just said, here is an ACRIS event, is, is this what I've highlighted? The entire ACRIS event, or is should type technically be in there? Well, the event is really um, again. We're using this right now to uh, originate orders, which is going to have multi, a collection of uh, of attribute value pairs, you know, that represent that order, um, and uh, but. Um, typically the event is just going to be a state change of one attribute of one object. It could be, you know, the, the status of order one, two, three, four is, um, fulfilled, right? It could be the, the temperature of room 101 is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Th those are, you know, statements that include a value, um, you know, like 75 or an enumerated value like fulfilled, but then the rest are tied to, you know, a semantic model, which would be, you know, uh, the, the type or class, which would be, you know, room or order. And then the, the subject or object, which would be 101 or one, two, three, four. And then the, and then the attribute, which would be temperature or, you know, order status. So it's, it's trying to take those components of that statement that's reacted to and, and separate them into, you know, distinct cloud event elements. Right, but and right but, now we, we're using data, you know, for both the, to, to store both attribute and values as pairs. Right, so what, what I guess I'm trying to wonder is whether we have, whether, whether the cloud event attributes like type are duplicating data, I'm sorry, duplicating information from data, or whether we, are, we have pulled information out of data and now only use the cloud event attribute for it. And the reason I'm asking this is because in my mental model of, of cloud events, they should not be modifying the, the original event itself, right? Cloud events is all about adding information 
to the event to make processing easier. So that may mean in some cases that you are, are seeing duplicate information. The cloud event type, as an example, might actually already be represented someplace inside of the data attribute. And that's okay because it, it, it means two different things to different, two different people, right? The processor of the data section is going to have one meaning for it, but at the cloud event level, it has almost a slightly different meaning, sort of, but it's okay that it's, it's duplicated. And so what I'm wondering is when, when you talk about this field and, and, and our use of it, um, violating the ACRIS model, that that's, makes me start to wonder whether we made a mistake and whether order should be in here someplace. So it should be type colon order inside here. That way we can modify this to be anything we wanted and it doesn't break the ACRIS model because this is only used by the cloud event routing processor. It's not used by the business logic, which cares about type equals order. You understand what I'm trying to say? So in the, in the, in the microservice that's going to act, potentially act on this event, right? And they would need to be able to look into data to say, okay, this is type order, which that's important to me. And then I'm also looking for, uh, you know, the order status is, you know, that's important to me. So, so the, 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 the function or microservice would have to open up data and look at all of this criteria be before it could know to react and produce a new event. But you're saying from a routing perspective, that type could be used differently. Right, so just, I'm saying just to be able to just to be <clears throat> able to route it to that function, right? For so consideration. In, yeah. So in in my model, the the component that it's actually going to process this event should only ever, for the most part, look at what's inside data. The fact that there are cloud event attributes should almost not be known to the processing function itself because the fact that this was sent using cloud events should almost be oblivious to it, or it, should be, it shouldn't matter to it. And, and, I, and that's why I'm wondering whether we've made a mistake in pulling out some business logic attributes like type and only put them out here. I, that, right? it, I, how would you format type? If so, you had it, I mean, or you're putting order in there, which is obviously that, that, in the, the semantic model is, is the, the class. So you want to say order released, but what, what's missing in there, you have the class and you have an enumeration of, a, of an attribute and you're not including the attribute. You're saying order released, like uh, uh, there's a direct relationship. I mean, there's only one status of, uh, or one attribute of an order, right? Order dot released. And what really it is, is it's order status released. And, and, and you know, I'm saying there's three, three parts to a semantic model. There's the, in addition to the subject, which is the, uh, the, the instance of that, of that class order. Okay, let me, let me pause here. What are the people on the call think? Am I headed down a really weird path or? Is everything okay the way it is in your guys' eyes? Because I, I, was, I was bothered by the fact that, that I, I advertise cloud events to people as we're adding metadata to help routing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you can send any events you want, and all we're doing is adding a couple extra HTTP headers, and life is great. Well, as I was coding this up, and you come across things like this trigger line where it says, okay, how do I know as a retailer um, whether I'm going to process this or not. Well, I can't just look at the source and type anymore. I need to crack open the data and understand the schema of the data to know how to go find order status and the provider fields, just to know whether I need to process this or not. Ah. And I don't know whether that's okay or not. Uh, it looks like the, the order released is really what the event is, right? Is it? It's, the, it's that state change that's significant. It's both it, it, between the, I think between the, I think between type and order status. And that's, that's what it 
encapsulates the state change, yes. And, and the, uh, the provider, so, The provider is the retailer. Who, who is the provider here? Remind me of that. So in this particular message, a customer placed an order. Oh, yeah. Let me look at a different example because that's actually a very, very bad example. No, but bad examples are good. Well, let's do an easy one first. Okay. So let's, look at, let's look at this one. So a retailer is going to be ordering more cups. So this event is supposed to be eventually picked up by a supplier. Okay. okay. So the source field is retailer dot, um, the retailer in question, type yes. is order, and then order dot status is order released. So in this particular case, should this, is it okay that as the receiver, I need to look inside data to know whether I need to process this or not? Or is that just part of the business logic? And sometimes business logic is, eh, I'm not gonna do anything. That's so okay. For me, the question is, are there, are there cases where the, 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 you're raising the order event and so the the order the type order event and that only differs in terms of the what the order status is like do you because that's the question like should there be a, an order dot order released event and an order dot order completed event that right. because because this seems like if i if i draw the parallel here to the the blob store thing right then the type if the type is if the type is just blob and then you have a blob status that is created and deleted and you know amended or whatever that makes dispatch really hard so i think the type should really go in and fully fully enclose and, and incorporate all the information that you need for dispatch so, so the idea here was to tie cloud events to a semantic model that provided semantic interoperability as well as interoperability within the syntactic syntactics of an event. And so, if you look and looked at what schema.org has, right, they have a um, semantic identifier for a type or class called order. And in there, you, an order has certain attributes and there are semantic identifiers for each of those. And then if that attribute has values that are enumerated, then it defines each of those enumerations as a semantic identifier. And so the idea was, is that if everybody was, if cloud events included those identifiers and everybody was adhering to the, the schema.org model, then everything would be understood inherently. And if you, so that, and that's how, that's how, you know, the, the, um, the demo has, has been laid out thus far to adhere to that. If you go and put in type something that is different than that, that model, you know, you're putting in something that you're making up just for routing, then in that's, that's not tying everybody to the same, to a, uh, a common semantic model. So, so then you're, so, you're looking for everybody to react based upon something you're making up rather than uh, identifiers that have been um, publicized for, for everybody to adhere to for semantic the interoperability. The question, the question I had was, is order, what is the event? Is the event order or is the event order released? The event is the statement, the um, status of order one, two, three, four is released. You could have another event that said um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the ship to location of order one, two, three, four is, you know, something else that maybe it changed and that would be another event. So Which, it's. Um, so, so then the event type is really order dot order released because you are reporting out the status change and, and you're, you're reacting to a particular status. Change. So within, within the order, within, and, and I think that's also what you just described, within the, within the type, the overall type order, 
there's multiple events that can be raised. One of them is order. Related. So when you map yeah, that, but, one, or, but when you map that thing to cloud event, then the type that shows up in the in the cloud event is not the type the 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 semantic model type that you're referring to, but it's really referring to the 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 status change event that you have. So it's kind of it, the mapping is not direct from the the business sc scope type to the event type, but really it's from the event that just happened inside of inside of your business object to the cloud event. Okay, but you're taking. Let's take the. You're, you're saying um, yeah, order released um, is a an event of an order, which is one type of um, type of, of an object. But it, it, if you were to say you're going to take action on an event that had to do with the temperature change in a room, right? Yes. So it's not just um, room temperature change. You know, it's going to be the temperature of the room changed to 75 degrees. I will, so it's trying to create a model that can accommodate all of these different changes. Well, that you, that, in all these different events. Right. And so you couldn't you can use what you just talked about where you put in the type. Uh, anything where you would take action, but but see that that's when you're taking. But, but what we're doing, what we're doing, for instance, in in let, let me let me map this to something we do in Azure, right? You can have a in in Azure in the Blob Store, right? We have a concept called Blob, and you can go and create a Blob, you can delete a Blob, you can go and amend the Blob, and you can you know change the properties of the Blob. But let's stick to delete and create because it's easy. The the create event is the create event and the lead events are distinct distinct events that applications are interested in uh, separately and mostly all of the apps subscribe to create so we're presenting this so we're presenting this for practical for practical reasons um, as distinct event types blob created is a distinct event types and that is part of Microsoft dot storage dot blob dot blob created. So it has a hierarchy. It's kind of sorted into the general inf the general model of uh, yeah, this all belongs to Blob. So that's part of the type, but really it goes it's scoped down to the 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 event that was raised uh, about that particular object that I'm describing with the subject and the and the subject and the, the source. Um, it's a distinct it's a distinct uh, uh, thing that happened to that Blob, and that is the creation of it. And here you have a distinct thing that happens to the order and that is the release of it. And that is what that event was describes. So it is this, this type field here is about the event type and not about the type of object that the event is about. That's something you express with source and with subject. I'm still not sure how you, um, again, if you made Type if you, in this case order dot released yes right where it's it's the it's the it's the class and and the status and the subject is still I, I assume in, the in, incident or excuse me the instance of that that type which would be order yes right correct. okay so so if you that this is one example where this seems to make sense now go go and how do you model uh, a, a, a temperature change in in a room in, in a similar way. The temp well, you will you will go and 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 uh, the the temperature change. Well, you would have a if you want if you what, want. What would be the type? What would be the type in that case? Um, it would be it would, sensor red. Sensor red or sensor change. And so it wouldn't be a change because you don't know if the, the actual temperature yes, changes. Exactly. It would be, because this changes the delta, that's the result. Well, you can go and do an, and you can assume that there's some analytic and some state machine, and the state machine has now decided that the change is big enough to admit your threshold, blah, blah, blah. So you can go and have a sensor change event. Okay. 
Um, I think if you start putting things together here in type where you're constructing something that is arbitrary and not tied to a semantic standard, then you're disconnecting from the semantic model. But, this no longer is. Uh, but I'm not. I'm, what I'm doing is that but, I think. Can I, can I try? The, I think what we're trying to say is it's, it's much more difficult to not embed the state machine of status inside of the type because you don't know how to route uh, the next state change. So you, you, order is the class, but order released is the state of that class. So it's not arbitrary. It's, it's well defined for this particular state machine. Okay. What, what if just, just for kicks, um, add, add, um, two other, uh, extensions here below, below type where you left type as order and then you put, um, actually, um, it's attribute or property. I don't care. Just something, right? And then you put in there um, uh, order status. And then you put value, which I still think could be data, but let's just say value for it, right? And then you put um, order released. So did, but this okay. goes if it was. Go ahead, sorry. You're, you're, there's a, conf so the thing you're conflating. Um, or it seems to be seem to be conflating is that you're interpreting type as the emitting class, and that's not what it is. That's how, right, that, well, that's how uh, I had used it. Yes, and as a, and as really a, is, as a placeholder for a class. Mm -hmm. And it is it is the the type here is really this distinct type of this particular event. If you were if you were turning this into an object model. You would have a, you would have, literally would have a class derived from a cloud event that would co would be called order released, and you would have a different class that would be called, you know, uh, order shift, and you would ha so you would have distinct events which are literally in incorporating the thing that you want to tell, which is the distinct state change that just happened. And if you go and take a look at you, if you if you if you visualize, if you visualize the 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 state model, the state machine for order processing, right? There's all these there's these state transitions that happen. On if you if you imagine in your head the, a state diagram, um, then then effectively all the arrows that go between the states, they're all effectively events that are being fired as an effect of that state change. They're kind of the, the photons that are being emitted from that from that operation. And each of those has a distinct type. And that distinct type is that type here. Okay. But but and that's fine. But let, let's just go back to how this model extends beyond just a, a you know, or because you, you we could potentially under type keep keep the order part tied to the semantic identifier of the of the uh, order class within schema.org, right? And then order released is is pretty much a unique, um, globally unique uh, enumerator, right? Um, so we could use that, but then I, I still wonder, there, there are other events, even in this demo, that are tied to uh, a, uh, a value. So there's there's inventory level going down to, to zero, which is triggering something. So how how does that get modeled in that case? Um, you have an inventory. The inventory, like every everything that raises events has a state machine, and the transition and the transitions of those state machines raise events. And so you have an inventory. You have the inventory that goes down to zero. So you have an inventory that has a that has a state machine around count. And uh, um, either you, you raise an event around the count chain, or you have um, a, uh, effectively an alert that's being raised um, only when that count goes to zero. Then you have a inventory, an inventory exhausted event that you're throwing. So it's, it's scoped to the source. So, so the source here is the source is the order system. The subject, so 
that the in on the inventory um the um well the the offer so if you look at if you look at type all right let's yeah. just put it in there try to make, lay it out the same way um go ahead and remove attribute and value from below doug so we so don't get that confused okay so we got so we're going to model the inventory level dropping down to a below a threshold to, to as an event that require that action is going to be taken. Yeah. So in, in type below, you had, again, tie into semantics, you had order, which is the class, and then you had an, an enumerated, uh, a semantic identifier for an enumeration after it, after the dot. Okay. So how, mm -hmm. how if we try to keep it a unified, unified um, model, then you would put under type the, what we're calling offer, which is, what we've been using. And then you have as an attribute of offer inventory level, and then you hit, which, which is not taking on enumerations. It's, it's taking on just, just values in integer values. Yep. Right. So, my, so how do uh, my point is what were, these are, these are state changes that you're reporting out. And, and the inventory level per se, that value is, um, if you want to, if you want to raise inventory level changed, which means if you want to go in and report out every time you add something or remove something, then that's, that's what you would do. You would raise the inventory level changed event, and then you can go in and filter on this and then you can, uh, look into the detail and find what the inventory level is, but you can go and dispatch on this, or you could go and also, you could show, choose to only to only have the inventory level exhausted event um, and the inventory level replenished event, which is effectively just the, around the threshold zero um, if you only care about that yeah and, and so the, all those things that you're calling it don't tie to a semantic model um, um, yeah you, and, you, and, at, you, it, and at yeah. that point at that point then I have to say that the semantic model is then, is then missing something that's important to build an app. Well, so I, okay, I, before we start heading down the path of saying there's, there's something wrong with the semantic model, I don't want to go there. But let me, let me ask a slightly different question because I, I still feel like that the, the, what we're doing today is we are mixing where information goes. Right? I feel like we are putting business level logic sometimes in the data section and sometimes in the cloud event, in the cloud event section. And it feels like that's not appropriate. It feels like all the business level logic needs to go into the data section, period. And anything that appears in the cloud event section is just extra noise simply for the purpose of cloud event routing. But if cloud event wasn't in the picture, a receiver of what's inside data should still be able to get its job done. Am I, am I incorrect in this? And the reason I'm, the reason you, me is, is Doug, when, when, what we have here feels like it's wrong in the sense that I think this should have offer type, type offer in there someplace. Well, it, it's, the what 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 is in data currently are attribute value pairs where those attributes are associated with the type offer right but how, how so it, they're not so they're not so they're not all at, not all at the same level you know you're okay. you're combining in data um at, attributes in, in a class so would it, this be more appropriate then yes Would that be better? Yes, because but then you have to you have to open that up in order to know whether to take action, which is fine. You open that up, and and those, that's what goes through your 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 rules well, that, within depends. that function. Well, it depends on when you say take action. I think it depends on who you're talking about, right? When you're talking about business level logic that says, okay. I need to know that inventory is zero to know to send more cups. That I agree. You have to open up this section to know how to do that or know whether to do that. 
Right. But in order, but in order for when you, but when you're talking about the action is simply, is this an event in general that I may or may not care about? Right. I don't think I should have to crack open this information to get there. I think I should want to say what type of event is coming into me. And in this particular case, what the type of event is offered at inventory level. And that's a, and that is a field that is 100% cloud event defined. So that if you're not actually using cloud events with the Acris model, this field does not exist. It exists only because you're using cloud events and therefore it's within our domain to define. Even if we call this thing foo, we're not breaking the Acris model. Okay, so, so what in this, in, in this, that's fine. What, what you show there is fine because it's still all tying back to, um, I don't think you need, I mean, if you have, if you, if you construct type as being offer, right, and then dot, and in this case, it's the uh, attribute identifier uh, of, of an attribute of offer, you know, you're, you, that, that works. I don't know why you need to offer again in under data that I, I mean, I, you, you would, okay. But if you change that to depleted, then where did that word come from? You're making that up. That doesn't, that doesn't tie to any, you know, to the semantics within schema.org. Right. And the reason I added that was to make a point in the sense that we could make up anything we wanted here. And I don't think it violates the ACRIS model because the ACRIS model has total control over what's inside. And we, and we as an as a, as a organization, if we're, we could, for example, say, when you take the ACRIS model and map it to a cloud event, this is what type is going to look like in particular cases. It may be, sometimes it may be ex exactly pulling in something from here verbatim. Other times it may be no. When this value is zero, it's inventory depleted. In other cases, it's inventory static. My point is the business logic from Acra's perspective should not care about this value because it should never see that value. Does that, does um, that, does that make sense? It, 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 it does, but you're, you're still having all participants that um that this is that what you put in type are semantics right that that everybody that uh is subscribing to this um ecosystem would would need to know about right and that in it, 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 it I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Um, I, I feel like there's two. Um, you're, you're trying to accommodate the the semantics, just throw it all in data, just to say, hey, there's the semantics. But the whole purpose of the semantics uh, identifiers was that it adhered to um, uh, a particular semantic model and didn't and didn't didn't get supplemented, which is what you're doing here. You're doing offer, which is good, but then you're changing it to inventory depleted, but which semantics, you're making up. But the semantics model is a static one, right? It's, it's, it's describing the state of, of a thing. What events do is they describe the change of that thing. So, so there's, a, there's a natural mismatch because you go and if you look at the semantic model, you, you're really looking at a static state of the world right now. And what we're doing here is we're actually reporting out on, on changes from, from changes from one state of the world to the next state of the world. And that exact, that exact state change is the thing we're, we're reporting out here. So right. you, and, and you could, you could say offer dot inventory level, and that implies that there was a state change to inventory level, right? If you just kept it like that offer dot inventory level, you know that changed. You can imply that it changed, and if you want to know what it changed to, you got to look into another another element. That, so and you can that, do this. I agree with you. Right. I, so I agree with you for that particular instance here. That actually makes a lot of sense. So and for 
And for order dot order status, you could do the same thing. So for the one below, you could do the same thing. We can say we can say order order status, and the order and there's an order status change. And you want to go and changed, go. right? If you did that, I'd be golden. If you could okay. live with that, so we can. So I'm what I'm what I'm pointing. So we can certainly live with the order status the order status change. So but. So, so, and here's here's where it becomes here where it becomes uh, um, uh, interesting from a practical building the application perspective. If you only wanted to, if you only want to react to the order status change of release, and or if you only want to react to the fact that the inventory level just dropped to zero, mm -hmm. then you, then you need to be able to go and filter at the infrastructure level over which has no notion of what your data fields are. You should. You need to be able to go and, and filter based on that. And what you will filter, want to be filtering on is some field that is well well known and well understood in cloud events. So, so as just added, so you might have order order status dot order release. That's that's a type that is now effectively distinctly saying here's a, here's a state change that just happened, right? And that state change is the order release state change and on the inventory level since that's a that's a number you probably don't want to report out every every um every potential value i mean you could as we discussed discussed earlier but inventory level depleted basically just means at that case it's zero which is a distinct thing you might also be interested in so there might be a case here that for in the interest of the application and the subscribers of the application you may want to go and take specific specific changes and report them out separately. So for the benefit. So, of the so what, what if we just did this, right? Because that, what, what's left in data up above under, uh, let's look at the top one, right? Uh, there's a lot of things in there that we just used to facilitate taking action because we weren't persisting history. But let's say that's the only the only thing that data would be in this case if you have offer dot inventory level and the type would be the number would be the, the number zero, which you could filter on. Because data at that point is just the value of your type. Is it, you know, the state change that you the of the um, of the attribute of the class that you've got all in type. But and is, is that adequate? Well, I, I have a, we have a, so now we're talking product. On the product side, in, in our world, we have an ironclad uh, um, uh, principle, and that is we never look into the message body for anything that we do in, this, in terms of dispatching. Like, we, my middleware would not be able to look into data. Okay, how about having an extension that, an uh, element that's just value, and we don't even use data. But now well, you, now you're just trying to accommodate the limitation that I just put put out. <laughs> well, but so it seems to me <laughs> there's a there's a high order question here, at least in my mind, which is, at what point do we put all data into the cloud event stuff versus keeping it inside the the body, right? When does when do we leave the boundary of routing versus business logic? And I don't want it. To, I don't want us to convert everything. I mean, because because we could take this take this type and do offered inventory level dot uh, zero dot small, right? We can, yeah. we can go really far on this thing and, and get rid of data entirely, but that's not really what we're meant to do here. So it feels like it, there's there has to be a line someplace that says. You you want classification, routing information, whatever you want to call it, at the cloud event level, but business level logic, that's that's more specific to this type of event that stays inside data. But it's the type of information, not the event. It, has to go it's up. A, it's it's got to be a balance. You know, right. you want to optimize routing to a certain degree, but then you don't want to. You got to be able to say, okay, I'm going to route optimally to this point but then after that you know for those that did get get it routed you know, you know got, are, are looking at that that it got routed to but they still don't know if they're going to take action some will so some won't that they right. got it routed to right right so there's I don't a balance know i think 
Yeah. I just don't know where that line is. I well, I I think the way you have type right now, that represents a level of balance in my mind. You know, so you're in not both. having to go into data to go get inventory level as a as as the specific thing about the offer that changed. Okay, so then are you saying that you think just this one is okay, or this one is okay too? No, I, I, the, the one below would be just, again, you have to be uniform in the model. And so it'd be order dot order status. Chain, you know that that changed. And so you would have to go in, you know, you'd route an order status change to um, those that were interested in it. And then they, they go look into data, see that, to see that it was order released. Okay. It's for for a particular application that that will that might be a reasonable choice right and so because because I, I was trying to equate this back to the examples you were doing comments of of a s3 data store kind of thing right mm -hmm. do you want to be able to filter on creates versus deletes and obviously for an s3 type of bucket thing i think that makes perfect sense because that's what they do today but maybe in this particular application saying you're going to filter on the order status that's a business logic thing. That's not a routing thing. And that's, and I think that's a perfectly fine choice, which means if we get rid of this, then in order for someone to take action, they still have to go into the body, but we're going to mentally say, that's not a routing decision at that point. That's a business logic decision. Yes. And I'm, and I'm okay with that as long as that's the way we present it. So don't ask us about that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and again, it's, it, type is not, fully optimized for routing, but it's giving you a, a significant benefit and, and being able to support semantic interoperability at that point. Right. And, that, because, and that's a huge, huge advantage for yeah, that, for that trade-off. And I think, I think what we have here is, is as you said, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a fair trade-off because when we had type as just a single word, offer, order, that's not really a whole lot of information because there are so many different yeah. types of those. It, I can understand yeah. why that would be, not, not appropriate. Okay, so let me ask this. If we change these two type of things, what is, do we need this? Or can we, can we, leave, can we live without that? Well, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm okay, sorry. So just, just the word offer, just the, just the wrapper of the offer, because we don't have that you, do, you do not, uh, you, you don't need the word offer, no. That's okay, okay. Parsed, parsed out of type. Okay, good. Okay. So is everybody on the call okay with this notion of going through here and any event that has just basically a single word up top, like order and offer, we're going to augment that with additional, with at least one more level of filtering capability. Yeah, that would be good. Okay, then, then it's worth, it's worth looking at though. And just, you know, for the order origination then, which includes multiple attributes, attribute value pairs, then I would assume that your type is just going to be order. Wait, which one? Which, you, you, which example? Well, it's, it's when the, a new order is originated by either the, the passenger or by the retailer. Okay. Right? Well, it's, going to include, it's going to include multiple so attributes. Here. Oh, customers placed an order. So I would think that that should just be type order without an extension to a particular attribute. Would this not be at least be order released? Or order status change? Or, I'm sorry, would it not at least be order status? You know, I, uh, because it, that, that's what's happened here, right? The order status has changed, and that's the reason we're sending an event. In this particular case, it's a brand new order. It's order, okay. that order released. You need to know it's new. Well, I think that's what we were talking about earlier, yeah. is where is the line, right? Is it, are we stopping at just the fact that if the order status has changed, or do we want to also filter and rank on the value of the status? It would make implementing this much easier if the order status was in the type. It, it may be, but is is <clears throat> is that business logic or is that routing logic? That's the question. 
it's routing logic. Well, <laughs> go ahead, Collins. I'm I'm leaning especially for these especially for these distinct distinct state changes on where you already know kind of you have an enum for an order status. Um, then I would say also like you will have a dis so for me the question is perspective of what the semantic model structure and consistency considerations are which which wh what are the handlers the handlers the handling code look like that you want to wire that you want to wire up and for me the 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 if you have these state changes um, on an enum, you will typically have some code that is handling each of the different state changes. So for those, I would fire different events. Um, for the inventory status, that's probably a different thing. If you choose to go and raise an event every time that number changes, then you, you would have one. You will have one handler. So on the two examples that I have that we have here, I would probably have. I would probably have. A, a single event raised for the inventory level, but for order status, I would have distinct events raised for each for each uh, enum uh, option. And, and I'm fine with putting a dot after that with with the with the specific enum. You mean like this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you can just say that the the way we're implementing this is that if it's uh, Type is going to have both the ontology class and the attribute identifiers. And if that attribute is an enumeration, you'll follow it with the, the enum mm -hmm. like you do there. If the, if the attribute is just a value, then you have to go pull the value out of data. Yeah. Does that work? That, that would work for me. I'm not sure I follow the last part, so let's go so, through. So going going back to inventory down below, okay. right? You don't have a dot after inventory level because it's not an enumeration. Ah, it's just I a quantity you. value. Gotcha. So if it's a quantity okay. value, you go you go into data and pull the gotcha. quantity. The quantity. Okay. okay, I like that. A consistent pattern. I can live with that. Scott, so so in this particular case here, you still have to go into the body. Um, to look at the provider, but I think that's okay because that's more along the business logic side of things. I think. Okay, so let's see. So in this particular case, this one would change because that's an enumeration, right? Right. And here, I think this would change too from action stat to action status. Is that right? And this would be, is that correct, Doug? Yep, yeah. I mean, what, what you're doing here, I don't even want to bring it up, that's fine. I, 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 <laughs> I think it's, I th I'm not gonna, I'm good with this. I got a little nervous, but I'm, this, this is fine. It ties completely to the semantic identifiers. And you're okay. just, and you're making, you're making it easy for routing, so. And it's in a, you're using it uniformly, you know, yep. with, within here. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, I, I'll go through and add these things. So this is action status. Okay. Um, anybody, while I'm doing this changes, anybody on the call have any questions, concerns? About this? Yeah, why, why do we have action and order status? Just make it status. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to touch that one. It's, it confuses the program a lot to have those two things. But the, Maybe but it makes order, sense. Well, but in order or, to change that, you'd have to change, the, you'd have to change the model. And I think that's one of the things you're trying to avoid, right? No, I'm, the model is wrong. It shouldn't have action status. It should just be status. No, I understand. But, but my point is, Acris, Acris has a model. And I don't think it's in our purview to say change that model today. Well, and, and we're not even, these identifiers are coming from schema.org. So it's trying to align with schema.org, which everybody is familiar with, you know. I don't, I don't, I don't know, know I don't use schema.org. It, 
it's trying to to come up with a i mean i i'm in the semantic world so i know there's a lot of references to that you know, gs1 is which is dealing with supply chain commerce they they throw throw things into schema.org so it just depends on what world you're living in you know i i'm in the semantic world Okay, I think I got them all. If not, we'll, we'll figure that out later. But is everybody okay with this direction? Okay, I think it, I think it makes a little bit more clean model because I was having a hard time distinguishing between business logic versus routing logic. And I think this makes it a little bit easier, at least in my head to understand. Okay, so um, ooh, we got two minutes left. Is there anything you guys want to bring up relative to the state of things, ignoring bugs in the possible code, but in terms of the flows and stuff like that, I know Clemens, you haven't had a chance to read it yet, so hopefully you will. Yeah, I will. But anybody else have anything else they want to bring up? I think it's too late to change it now, but the the, the, the controller being the central hub that f makes everything flow is a little weird. Like, it, it should be that the trucks get to say what they deliver to, not the controller it tells the trucks what to do. Well, the reason it's, we did that is because yeah, I, yeah, I understand why, but yeah. it's it's not very it's messaging. We, like we made a very compelling messaging demo. I yeah, I, I, we yeah, in a real world scenario, I agree. The problem is we we have, we have that many participants, and everybody has to be evenly distributed, and it is what it is. So anyway, okay. Um, anything else? All right. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. And um, we'll talk again, I guess, on Monday. Hopefully, between now and then, more people will come online and, and we'll get the demo a little more solid. Because I think there are still some bugs in there. We just need to flush them out. All right. I'll look at it. All right. Cool. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thanks. Bye.